Well, first of all, good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending upon when you're viewing this particular uh, mission. Uh, I'm Mark Parkey, of course, notorious for American Peril Call to Arms, and of course, in the new Call to Arms, The Storm Upon Us. We're also, of course, uh, filling in the gap with the tape that you're probably very familiar with. That's why you're watching this one called Equipping for the New World Order, Part 1. In Equipping for the New World Order, Part 1, we concentrated on the individual, the person. Now, we knew for a fact that uh, out there amongst the Patriot Movement and throughout all of the militias, there are many people who do not have military experience and were in need of some guidelines or at least some general ideas of how to establish uh, field gear, what type of equipment to choose, and the basic necessities of the individual in the field. In Equipping for the New World Order Part 2, we're going to be covering a variable plethora of equipment, material, and support technology that's been developed, some of it by the militias here in the Midwest and in Michigan, uh, and of course most of it having been borrowed from armies across the planet. Now one of the advantages, unlike the regimented militaries under bureaucratic control, one of the advantages that we have in the militia is that we can choose what it is that works. If it works, we use it. If it doesn't, well, it gets relegated to second line use and eventually it's phased out as it tires out. But with the militia, we've been able to take equipment from many different nations around the world and of course from many different generations of equipment inside the United States and are able to integrate them to the needs of the specific militia formation that's in the field in its particular area, terrain, and weather environment. As originally demonstrated in equipping for the New World Order Part 1, the regular or infantry web gear, in this case a combination of the M1956 uh, web gear uh, between wars, the Korean and Vietnam, and also, of course, Alice gear, we come up with what is a desirable individual system for equipment carrying. Uh, as, is dem as was demonstrated, and a quick review will be necessary, uh, first of all, the individual first aid and compass pouches were utilized. Also, the M14 magazine pouch, two mag pouch. The individual pistol magazine pouch, circa 1910. The US M16 mag pouch. Also, U.S. canteen covers, in this case canvas with canteen cup and two plastic canteens from the Vietnam War era, the M1910 first aid kit, the M1956 type butt pack, and of course shelter half is provided. In addition to this, of course, other elements can be attached, many other pieces including the old M1956 type H suspender harness, which is the original attachment, and, of course, uh, Y-type Alice gear. In all cases, this individual system is customized to the needs of the individual soldier and also his capabilities. Either more or less is attached depending upon weight restrictions and also his individual field requirements for either a reconnaissance mission, combat assault mission, or long-range infantry actions of some type. Now, this is what is known basically as your fighting load, and, of course, there are other elements that are attached to this, including the house pack, or house load, as it's called, an individual backpack chosen by the person or by the mission commander for the particular actions of that militia formation. Again, at the needs and requirements of the commander, these systems are adopted or negated in favor of newer or improved technology that may be provided to the militia. Alternate technology that's available for both the SKS, the AK-47, the AKS, AKM, uh, the AR-15, Daewoo rifles, and many, many others in the what are considered to be the carbine category or assault family of weapons, uh, entail different types of magazine pouches, etc. Uh, demonstrated here from our Militia Support Industries technology, one of the many plants that have been established across the country, uh, supporting new equipment for the militia, uh, obviously uh, anticipating the cutoff of resources from overseas, is the M1947 um, AK-47 magazine chest pouch. Now the original chest pouch system of this type that was provided and was being imported in the United States was made in communist China and was banned from import. Now mind you it's important to remember that this particular chest pouch doesn't kill anybody. But obviously the federal government or agencies of the New World Order uh, thought that it would be a bad idea for these to be uh, continuously provided to the Patriot Movement and shooters in general across the country because of its effectiveness as a simple carrying system to support militia operations. One chest pouch, one weapon, and off you go. Well, in this case, because these are no longer available in any large numbers, and yet are still desirable and necessary for garrison duty and other operations, as described in Equipping for the New World Order Part 1, the new system that is presently available, whereas the original was designed to, was designed to provide carrying space for three 
or six two in each pouch uh, AK-47 30 round magazines the new system which can be altered at the discretion of the manufacturer for the needs of the shooters is designed to handle an individual drum magazine and two standard 30 round stick magazines for the AK-47 slash AKS or in this case a converted uh, SKS to AK magazines one of the new changes and an advantage in the system is that the individual chest pouch is provided with stay points for the standard field gear connectors. This means that other magazines can be attached, individual first aid pouches can be attached, compass pouches or individual first aid pouches such as this model can be attached. It is a matter of ingenuity on the part of the, of the operator and his needs. Now one of the important things that is stressed with uh, militia operations is flexibility. Individual shooters have specific needs depending upon body size and structure. This is called ergonomics. In this case, this chest pouch design will be available in at least six different design types. It will be American-made with all United States components, not made overseas. Uh, the strapping material, in reality, was originally provided uh, via the great, great effort of World War II against the Axis powers. The canvas or sailcloth material is available in many different colors, in this case white for the test many different colors, in this case white for the test models and also for snow camouflage operations during winter exercises. And of course the snaps or Velcro or other closers can be determined by the individual operator depending upon his needs as he orders the technology. Now these are a very simple system. They're designed to cross over and in this particular case the American system, unlike the Chinese, has a quick release stay system that's available. And you may be very familiar with it if you have a pair of suspenders that you're wearing right now. Again, the advantages, existing technology drawn off the shelf and available to the militia forces across the nation. These systems are virtually being made in mass, tens of thousands at a time now in several different militia plants that have been very successfully manufacturing and designing systems for the needs of the militia itself. They're very specific. They're, they are, of course, coming up with innovative ideas. And we also ask that those of you who are listening continue to endeavor to develop technology of this type. If you have a problem, come up with a solution. One of the other problems that we have had attached to this, of course, is the idea that while we may be able to access these, even from our own production facilities, there are still other systems that are available. If you see them, grab them. In this case, what we have is a Canadian version of the same basic chest pouch, also known as poor man's body armor. One of the advantages to having the uh, magazines held high on the body is that they do provide some protection from small arms fire. Of course, you're going to lose the magazine, but probably that's better than losing your life, I assume. And uh, the systems, while they are very user-friendly, in this case, utilizing a quiet connector, plastic, plastic fittings, and will hold one standard 30 round magazine for the AK-47 or of course FAL magazines and will also provide stowage for the M16 magazine. Any system of comparable size can obviously be used. Note again the variances on the technology going from the American Patriot system, Canadian technology and in this case of course also Chinese technology. All of them very desirable, any one of them more than usable for the Patriot. Now, in addition to this system, we also have a series of magazines provided for many defunct tyrannies that presently, of course, are being made available on the Renner Revolution market. This includes, in this case, uh, East German uh, AK-47 uh, 40 round magazine pouches and 30 round magazine pouches. You may have been familiar with these, having seen them at gun shows or other source points such as surplus stores. It may be noted that in this case, this is the original color configuration, but at the need of the shooter and of, at, at the need of the individual unit, depending upon terrain and environment, the colors have been changed. This particular one was re-dyed by the operator, and as you can see, successfully was darkened while not changing the camouflage value of the equipment that was being used. In all cases, remember, we have to tailor the equipment to the weapon system. This, more than anything else, has to be a major consideration with regards to how the, the spare magazines or ammunition is stowed on the person, and also when shopping around or trying to identify specific technology support, even if it's commercial baggage. Remember again, try to find original systems that were adapted to the original weapon, and then integrate them with existing American technology to improve the overall performance of your unit. 
Again, a fairly quiet closer snap, but in this case, these are made of metal. And it will be noted, very simple release. These are good and stiff. And what we're demonstrating here is a 40 round magazine, East German manufactured for the AK-47, AKS, slash, of course, the converted uh, SKS carbine. A very desirable weapon system. This technology, of course, is again reasonably priced, and while it is still available, we recommend that you buy as many magazines as you possibly can. Now, while we are on the subject of magazines, assemblies, and components, and also supporting the weapon system, we might want to turn for just a moment to the concept of carrying additional stowage items. Obviously, we're concerned with ammunition drum magazines, which are important, and anybody who does have a magazine-fed weapon that can purchase drum magazines should purchase at least one for each weapon. In addition to that, though, uh, it is obvious that a cleaning kit is mandatory. One of the things that, uh, of course, will mean the difference between life and death on the battlefield is whether or not we can maintain the weapon system when the time comes. Either use existing cleaning kits and systems that are available and e-readily available from surplus agencies that also provided the weapon, or improvise and fabricate as needed what you feel are the tools that are necessary to keep these systems functional. Another point should be, whenever possible, acquire all support technology in as great a volume as possible. In this case, SKS stripper clips will also work, of course, to at least stow the ammunition efficiently, but eliminate some of the cumbersome packaging that the ammunition normally comes in. In addition to all of the other parts, also spare parts are crucial. These SKS return springs, or in this case, I'm sorry, tappet springs, were made by a U.S. manufacturer, many plants across the nation that are working with the militia movement, and are producing large quantities of spare parts virtually in the millions. These parts are not foreign made, these parts are American made. And again, spares should be carried. This particular spring, is underneath the front sight or the rear sight of the SKS carbine and if you've disassembled this weapon you know that this is probably one of the first springs you will lose. Note that the shooter is carrying three. Almost all of our systems carry onboard spare parts in buttstock stowage or in other areas of the weapon where when needed they can be accessed and of course utilized to keep the weapon, weapon functioning in the field. Again, integrated support there are also stowage points on the magazine on magazine pouches themselves, such as the chest pouch. These smaller pouch points on the side can be used for the cleaning kits, oil bottles, and also for spare parts that will be essential to support the weapon system at hand. Remember also, and we will do this constantly through any of our training tapes, do not lubricate the ammunition. And again, shiny, clean, make sure that you inspect the ammunition for damage, dings, dents, also for perforations or for oxidation and corrosion. When carrying it in web gear or when carrying it with military support gear, we have a tendency to find that moisture does collect and stay with steel components. Magazines themselves should be lightly lubricated. Ammunition should be withdrawn from the magazines, should be stowed separately. The, weapon, the magazines themselves along with the weapon should then be properly lubricated, wiped back down, and then the magazines lubricated, wiped back down, and then the magazines should be reloaded. There are several different components, of course, and as we've already shown you, I want to remind you again that the standard AK-47 magazine, in this case an East German 30-round stick mag, is relatively inexpensive at this time to provide for your militia forces. Each weapon should have a minimum of six, and that is considered to be a bare minimum. Preferably, as many as you can afford would be, the best, would be our best option at this time. In the hands of the gun dealers, it's most likely that when the time comes, they'll be confiscated because they're in a central location. Instead, we need to see all of these parts and assemblies dispersed as, as well as possible out to the users at this point in time. These will not be the weapons that fight the entire war, but rather will be just one of the many weapon systems that will be utilized as a stopgap measure until such time as our militia weapons production can reach full production levels. The thing here, first of all, is one of the entire families of cartridges used by both the Colonial Marines in all 37 to 38 states that are presently operational and many of the calibers presently used by the militia, excluding standard 762 by 39 which is of course also in service. We have the 50 caliber, 300 Winchester, the Zussman Ackerman discarding Sable 45 caliber round, approximately a 500 grain and for the potential about 3,800 feet per second. The standard uh, 223 round, 30 caliber carbine, Standard 30 caliber toke rev, which is specific to the Colonial Marines. And of course, since we have the 30 toke rev, 
We now have 30 caliber discarding Toker F, which uh, carries a 4250 grain 223 bullet, uh, normally a Spitzer. Uh, the, poten the potential ballistic for this is approximately 2,300 feet per second and will penetrate almost all body armor that is in existence. In addition to the standard 9mm cartridge, but again, what we are demonstrating here is improvising, utilizing existing, existing technology. The Zussman cartridge is a belted cartridge, and the Toker F pistol round, of course, is a standard pistol round. In this case, we might mention also, made from a standard 223 rifle round cartridge. When, these piece, when, when this brass is collected and some is found to be damaged around the neck or shoulder, this case can be cut down and reutilized as a standard Toker F pistol round. And again, remember, now you have a training round that can be reloaded over and over and over again based on a, rifle, a piece of rifle brass, which has a much stronger and thicker cartridge wall. Again, the performance ratio is much higher, and the recoil and felt recoil for the shooter is much lower. This is also desirable for our older shooters who may have some difficulties with the recoil of many of the handguns that are out there. In this case, just as a short example of one of the many Toker F, uh, cartridges, uh, Toker F cartridge pistols that's available, the CZ family of weapons are very well engineered, very well designed, and reasonably available. Also, magazines, in this case an original one, are also produced inside the continental United States by USA Magazine and some other companies, and again are reasonably priced so that you can support this weapon for at a very economical level. Colonial Marines, of course, are standardizing on sophisticated new rounds that are developing new families of weapon systems across the country. The Zussman Ackerman cartridge came from one of our new munitions plants in the South Midwest and is capable of producing virtually millions of these rounds at our discretion, utilizing as a base pattern other cartridges from around the world. You might also note that there are many different systems that are available and on hand, and again, this is just the opening family that will be necessary and will be utilized depending upon availability. You will remember that in the equipping for the New World Order Part 1 tape and in many other discussions that we've had across the country, we have not recommended standardizing on any one system, and there is a reason for that. If the other side had some idea of what we were standardizing on, then they know exactly what to choke off and ensure that it wasn't well, that that system was not available to the militia, the patriots, or the colonial marines. We might remind you, as we showed earlier in this particular uh, segment, that the standard AK-47 chest pouch, a very simple system that would provide support for the uh, AK family of weapons and the AK magazines has been banned from import in the United States, a non-lethal item, but obviously a viable item that the Patriot Movement can use. We have to come up with solutions, and again, here are some that you can choose from yourself. At this point in time, we're going to cover some of the more specialized weapon systems provided uh, uh, for by the militia. On a regular basis, heavy long-range weapons with telescopic sights, obviously, not necessarily sniper rifles, but counter-sniper rifles, are being employed throughout all of the militia and colonial marine forces across the nation. You might, as you recall, notice that we have used the term improvise many times, and this is a classic example of utilizing what's on hand to the best of your ability. The particular snow camouflage cover mounted on this particular weapon was made up from a white dress shirt. Notice that with a little bit of sewing, it covers the front of the scope area, the entire forestock, the barrel, and is attached utilizing existing button points and, of course, the original seam points that were on the shirt. This is a very simple system, very easy to imp improvise uh, and, and use uh, off the shelf. And for those of you seamstresses who are out there watching this right now, you're probably saying, I can do that. Well, you're right, you can. So again, it's only a matter of imagination, and there are many different solutions being found across the country. This is a good example of one of them. But what we're looking at here is the basic support technology for a sniper or a counter-sniper unit in an operational area. Now, you will, of course, change, or you can change, the technology that you're using depending upon budget and resources. In this case, first of all, reconnaissance is a primary concern. We're looking at photographic intelligence, utilizing a 35 millimeter camera, but the, uh, the technology will vary depending on what you have available. And today, video cameras are also quite popular. Remember, too, that while you're carrying the camera and you're carrying film in it, always carry spare film, and whenever possible, date the package and identify what film is in there with how many exposures. In this case, I believe this is a disposable camera, a throwaway. An excellent option because, again, you're not concerned with losing it. 
If you do take the photographs but have to dispose of the evidence for a short period of time, you can leave this without crying about it, unlike the 35 millimeter commercial camera. Once reconnaissance has been done, and also while reconnaissance is being done, other optics are, of course, desirable. The more detailed the, uh, the optic work done, the more likely it is you're not going to fail when the time comes to perform the mission. Remember also that with uh, any type of long-range shooting operations, the spotter should also be provided with optics. In this case, should also be provided with optics. In this case, a simple set of binoculars, a commercial grade, uh, desirable to have any kind of optics as opposed to no optic uh, technology. In uh, the second the example that's given here, we also have a Russian spotting scope, handheld, of course, or these could be established with a, sim a, a, mono a uh, monopod or a tripod as needed. And they can be improvised utilizing sticks or other components in the field. Well, of course, the other important option with regard to any type of operation of this type is communications. Now, hands-off communications are still the best and are available in many different types of systems, but the multi-channel FM short-range transmitters are an excellent option, have been tested extensively by both the Colonial Marines and regular militia formations and regular military units around the nation, around the world, and we find that these particular systems are very desirable. This particular model is a five channel, which means you have five separate frequencies to choose from. And these types of systems can also be used effectively with fire teams and squads in combat operations when you are a platoon commander. Consider this, that the squad leader can have one system with five frequencies. And in the process, each individual squad or fire team can be on only one frequency with a single channel radio. The advantage is there will be no multi-channel multi clatter inside the earpiece of an operator. He will hear only the frequency that he needs to, talking to his own troops. The squad leader can have a multi-channel transmitter that, so that he can communicate with the platoon leader and with other squads, and yet then isolate his communications to talk to his own people as needed. Consider this, you have five different frequencies, so you can have four separate squads and a command element on their own channels. Another option, of course, are simple handheld radios. There are many different types, both in uh, FM, AM, 2 meter, 4 meter, also 20, 30, yes, 60 and 80, depending upon crystals, and of course how much money you want to spend. Obviously, what we're looking at here is a very economical solution. They can also, of course, be in CB. This is a more uh, advanced uh, system here, a little, little uh, bulkier perhaps, but again, we're taking advantage of existing on-shelf technology. What we wanted to demonstrate is that there are many different antennas to choose from also, depending, first of all, upon mission type, and also the requirements of the individual radios themselves. Now, unlike the headset units, which have a built-in whip system which wraps around the top of the head, around the, the crown of the head, these individual systems are retractable, if you use the model, similar to what I'm using for a pointer right now, or are rubberized, armored, flexible antennas, which can take a great deal of abuse in the field. Again, at your discretion, you'll need to choose the technology that will, first of all, obviously, suit your budget, Second of all, also suit the tactical needs of your environment. There are restrictions with all of the different types of communication that are used. Remember that in many cases, even though the systems are fairly sophisticated and fairly modern, they're still limited for the most part of line of sight communications. One of the interesting things you should note with all of these radios is if you read the back of them, you will find that under FCC guidelines, all of these radios had to accept a specific amount of interference by law. They're intentionally reduced in range and capability because the government wanted it that way. So you need to evaluate the technology that's available, find out what will best suit your needs, and then employ it properly, test it, and experiment with it. Now we're going to turn over here for just a moment, and there's something you may have noticed sitting off to the side. While we certainly have a lot of weapons that make noise, Understand that the personal fighting weapon, especially the knife, is a silent weapon. The objective behind an operation of this type is not to make any noise and not to be noticed. So before this thing that goes boom is used, in many cases this may be the preferred weapon of choice under certain circumstances. It's highly recommended that if you are going to purchase uh, any type of blade weapons, again you need to do research with regard to fit to the individual operator. There are many adept individuals who can recommend different systems for you. And again, the knife, like the handgun, for the most part, is a personal choice firearm. Or is a, I'm sorry, a personal choice weapon, just as the handgun is a personal choice firearm. 
There are many people who argue back and forth about different technologies, different systems, different equipment that's available. But remember, when push comes to shove, it's a matter of whether or not this will go where it's supposed to and continue to function after you've used it the first time. In all cases, as we are demonstrating here, ammunition is the base for everything that's being done. You will notice, of course, first of all, that the ammunition is being properly stored in a conventional munitions can of some type. Remember, the government already did the research. You can't do much better. Take advantage of existing shelf technology and also make sure that you are consistent with the ammunition. You will notice that here again we're using a specific grade of ammunition that is peculiar to the type of weapon being used. And again, consistency is crucial. We're looking at quality technology, mated with a quality weapon system. You come up with an excellent end result. While this next phase has been covered by many different uh, authors in the last couple of years, chemical warfare protection and also safety protection devices are very important. Uh, there will be another tape and there will be other work being that has, been, that has already been generated by other people on chemical warfare protection, but we do need to review the basic technology. This mask, of course, is the M15 combat mask used by the Israeli military, though probably made by the German, German government. This has a standard voice meter, a drinking station, and, of course, has a forward-mounted uh, gas mask filter. It has a triangular eyepiece with a wider angles and directional uh, uh, access so that the uh, operator is <laughs> not as claustrophobic. It also gives some better peripheral vision, which is important, especially in a combat situation. And it should be noted that, of course, these masks, for the most part, have been coming out virtually new in the box, unissued. Now, at this point in time, I'd like to point out several features of this particular mask as it shows up. First of all, it is as a new package in a plastic over bag, which covers all the all the devices that you see here, with the exception of this, which was an add-on system. One of the tech pieces that is usually misunderstood or not properly identified is this particular device. And for most of you who are concerned with training with your chemical warfare protection, rather than opening up and breaking the seal on the filters as they presently exist, you are provided with an excellent training aid. The restrictive hole that is in the base of this particular device is designed, when screwed into place, to simulate the suction of a standard gas mask filter. This allows you to train without compromising what is, in many cases, a very expensive replacement item. You may notice that the nomenclature on this you may notice that the nomenclature on this particular fil filter is in Hebrew, while in many cases you may find it in German, and in some cases either so either uh, uh, Arabic or English. Either way, these filters were all made by the same companies in Germany, in Europe, and Israel, for the most part, does not make its own chemical warfare protection technology. It's all done overseas. A very special industry, it is important to remember that this filter is a full NBC, Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Warfare Protection System. While the filters may be reduced in life because of new chemicals that are, that are brought into the battlefield, and new biological agents, this filter is still effective for a set period of time, either plus or minus its original designation, depending entirely upon the, the attitude and also the density of whatever agent or chemical uh, technology is being employed. The particular frame you see here is designed to maintain the structure of the mask while it's in storage, and yes, can be left in the bag, in, inside the mask, in the bag, during storage with uh, prior to combat operations. Another piece that is provided in the system is, of course, a drinking apparatus. Now, it will be noted when you try to fit this on a standard U.S. canteen, it won't fit. It is designed around a standard German and or British canteen system, which is popular in Europe but not seen very often in the United States. So you do have to shop around to find, what, find a system that will mate with this. Again, it is new. Maintain it with the equipment. You never know what it is you're going to find on the battlefield, so if you don't have it right now, you may still have it in the future. Again, the important thing to remember is at least you have the technology to get out of a situation or to protect you from conventional chemical agents. It is not as likely as most people uh, would like to think that we're going to see heavy biological. Unfortunately for both sides, biological will kill both sides. And even with some uh, precautions that are taken, it is more likely you're going to see, as with the Branch Davidian situation, heavy chemical agents used. Uh, phosgene, mustard gas, CSCN. In whatever configuration or forms, this mask is more than adequate for the technology you're going to face. Also, it will offer some protection against radiological contamination because with the filter in place, 
the filter will block and load a specific amount of particulates uh, of, say, a radioactive material that is transferred with other dust particles, etc. The filter is going to be discarded and, of course, buried or disposed of, but it will offer some protection. Obviously, it's not going to protect you from any radi radioactivity, but it will eliminate some of the possibility of ingestion through the respiratory tract. One of the other considerations, and this is another option, is a hose. This particular system is an adapter. It was made for the Russian chemical warfare technology. Oh, but those crafty Russians being what they are, this particular thread system that's on their gas mask is the same as the Israeli and all NATO standard equipment. This umbilicus can be attached and the standard filter attached to it. And you have, of course, an extension device which takes the filter away from the front of the face and the filter can be stationed in another location or inside the gas mask bag itself when worn in a high carry system to the left of the body. There are different advantages to this, and obviously not the least of which is filter changing, which is more easily controlled with the device not sitting on the end of the face. One of the other advantages to this system is obviously the cost. These are very economical gas mask systems. They're as sophisticated as the M17 US mask presently in issue, or A1 or A2 and are as effective as most of the new systems that are online. Now, in addition to the basic gas mask and protection that we do know that it offers, even if you're not in a chemical environment, there are still other safety considerations that should be considered. Number one is eye protection. Yes, I know, OSHA will tell you all about how you basically have to have battle armor simply to use a hammer nowadays. Well, this is for another, another reason. On the battlefield, there are a number of uh, projectiles, objects, and devices, not the least of which are dirt and sand, which can create a problem for you. Uh, and, of course, remember, you're a long way from assistance. Cold wind and extreme cold weather. Warm wind or sand and dust and extreme hot weather. And, of course, simple uh, wind protection during almost any other types of environmental conditions, including rain. And so it is very desirable that you acquire a combat goggle of some type. Again, at your discretion, with the amount of money or resources you have available, you can choose a basic system. But again, they're simple to stow, very desirable for long-term use, and again, history has proven that they do serve a purpose. One other thing, and again, we're not selling a certain company here or anything like that, but uh, ear protection is important. Many of the weapon systems that we've shown do create a, a noise peak or a hypersonic crack, which is detrimental to hearing. Now, trust me, when you pull the trigger on that weapon, somebody's going to know where you are. So as far as uh, worrying about hearing what's around you, unfortunately, if you've ever fired a weapon, you do know that it affects the hearing immediately after the first round, and your, your hearing is reduced dramatically. To protect against that type of injury, and also from heavy ordnance, which may be used in your area, Earplugs are highly recommended. Also, in a chemical warfare environment, they should be used. Remember that the ear channel is an air passage. And so whatever could normally be passed through your lungs uh, via the mouth of the nose is also, to a limited extent, passed through the ear channel. For that reason, earplugs are very desirable. And also, another device which is not demonstrated here, but is demonstrated in other tapes and training aids, a complete hood for the uh, gas mask is also very desirable. Safety technology is a very simple and straightforward thing to consider. Eye protection, ear protection, obviously because God only gave us so many parts, are an, are an important issue. Well, respiratory speaks for itself. Without any kind of gas mask, how long can you hold your breath? Oops. The next point that we're going to be bringing up is the use of layering, especially with winter operations. Now, while certainly we have many different types of camouflage patterns that are available, many different systems, in this case, East German splitter pattern, or also known as a rain pattern. Uh, while this is available, there are many other different uh, patterns that may be on hand, U.S. woolen camouflage, green, such as you're seeing uh, attached to my arm, and of course, uh, a plethora of different systems from all over the planet. In this case, though, the East German uniforms are a very economical system, and for your uh, non-combatants and your combatants, a very, a very desirable way to go with regard to the purchase of quantities of equipment to keep your people in clothing. In this case, we're looking at standard weight, approximately 65-35 or 50-50 cotton polyester blend uniforms designed to give you a first layer beyond your normal insulated underwear or your conventional skivvies, as the Marines used to call them. And the Navy. Call them. And the Navy. As a matter of fact, this system can, of course, vary, but is still consistent throughout every military force and, for that matter, any people across the planet. Well, the next step beyond the conventional uniform, though, is winter weather gear. 
Another solution, and again very economical right now because the government is going away from wool, and why we're embracing it very quickly, uh, is the old M1952, M1954, and the uh, 1956 series uh, wool uniforms. In this case, a two-pocket top, standard button configuration long sleeve with a set of pants with adjustable waistband. These are an excellent winter system, and in all cases, they also come with the capability to accept liners. So you're looking at an insular layer with another insular, insular layer attached to it. Now, one of the reasons for adopting a layer system, even though there are many sophisticated technologies that are on hand right now in clothing, is that as need be, you can ventilate and cool or take layers off as your labors increase and as temperature increases to eliminate the possibility of sweat and building up moisture, which will freeze later if not properly addressed. Uh, the other consideration is the fact that while certainly some of the new technology will not load as quickly with uh, human body oils and sweat, they still load nonetheless. Loading is when the, the uh, different oils and, and material, such as water or body moisture, saturate the fabric and eventually becomes unserviceable with regard to thermal protection. Even though many of the different technologies, such as Gore-Tex, etc., are very desirable, even they load within a specific period of time. And one of the biggest problems that we are seeing is, again, replacement in the field. These pieces of equipment can be addressed, can be uh, shelled off, cleaned, and then reapplied as needed, so that at no given time are you bare to the wind, shall we say. One of the other types of technologies, of course, and again drawing from the East Germans, because again, a very economical system, very desirable, very well made, are the quilted pattern winter gear that they have provided uh, through, again, this defunct tyranny that uh, presently is just joining up with the rest of the New World Order tyranny crowd. This is an insular top, and in addition to that, of course, along with the fur-lined uh, neck, which is detachable, by the way, we also have a quilted pants system, cuffable at the base, and this type of system is, again, very desirable. It matches most of the uh, contours and the uh, patterns and, of course, uh, environments of the brownout season of winter across the United States. It is, of course, a very desirable pattern for pine forest operations, and there are many parts of the nation where you virtually disappear with this particular camouflage pattern in place. Now, again, these systems can be overlapped, one on top of the other, to offer an excellent thermal cover to protect against the elements. Not always are we running around on the battlefield. Remember, at certain times you have to stand in place. Now, for that reason, we must also consider that beyond these layers, we may have to alter camouflage configurations accordingly. And there are many different types of technology, but in this case, we're switching to West Germany, where we find the pine frond snow camouflage pattern is readily available. Solid white can be used, and in fact is used regularly by the militia, but breaking up the pattern is very desirable since for the most part we don't plan on being caught in the middle of the field. Preferably, we should be working in an environment or a situation where the colors are broken up, therefore, the pattern of the equipment you're using probably should be broken up too. While the pants are an overshell made out of cotton, there is also a poncho cover or coat cover made of the same material, and again in the pine frond pattern, which is random and broken up, and uh, this particular system is an effective uh, form of camouflage in the Michigan and, of course, all of the northern temperate areas, readily available and very economical. I will recommend something, though. If all you have are bed sheets and you wish to simulate this, a wetted brush that is dried to a medium level, then dipped in the uh, paint of your choice, uh, can then be brushed down to any white material to simulate this pattern and can be done with a little practice, almost as well as the spray-on technology that was used to make this particular pattern in the first place by one of the governments in question. Beyond the snow camouflage shell, which all of you are very familiar with in different patterns again, there's American, German, Russian, and a whole family of technology in this area made available now, we still have to consider the face and, of course, the hands which are exposed. You may have remembered this from the Equipping for the New World Order Part 1, spandiflage. This particular material can be purchased in a variety of different colors and configurations. This is the face hood, which as you will notice will spread and stretch to the needs and the size of the head of the wearer. One of the big advantages of this material is also to be used with glasses. Now it's recommended with the original manufacturers that you can cut eye holes in this material, but it's not necessary in order for it to be effectively used. What this is is a stretchable gauze. 
Now, myself, I have glasses to worry about, so I also have to worry about reflection. And there are chemical treatments for the glasses that you normally be wearing, but if you don't have the luxury of that technology, you can cover the glasses, along with the rest of your face, with a spandiflage and still effectively see through it and function within reasonable parameters. In addition to that, of course, we're talking about head covers next to go along with this. And, of course, we're seeing the standard uh, goggles put in place. In this case, an M1943 hat, there are many different variations. We really don't need to get into specifically what headgear. But whenever possible, try to choose temperate weather headgear for most of your operations. Why? Even in the desert, it gets cold. And the important consideration here is to have the capability to cover the ears, which are a vulnerable area, and also wrap around the back of the head and the back base of the neck. This particular hat is very simple, again, very economical, made overseas, and it's lightly quilted, leather sweatband, and with a brow piece. The brim is very important, especially for, again, sun protection. The goggles can easily be secured up above, out of the way, and as demonstrated earlier, are an essential item for most of the operations that, are in, that you are going to be participating in. Now, while many people consider different devices tools, I consider the scarf to be one of those. There are so many different things that can be done with it, and I know this one's in gray. They can be in green, blue, yellow, pink. Well, actually, you do want a camouflage color now, don't you? This particular device, though, can be used as a pillow in the field, a tourniquet, any one of a hundred different uses. Uh, it's at your discretion that you carry one, but I would recommend it, especially in winter operations, to cover all those little nooks and crannies that are normally not protected in, winter, in a winter environment from some of the, with some of the other clothing. Now we'll get to the other important part of the body and the upper torso. The body and the upper torso, the fingers and hands. It's important to remember here that there are a number of systems that can be accessed. And of course we do have standard uh, D3 or D3A gloves and glove liners. Also gauntlets. And of course standard leather gloves that are insulated. In this case again East German. They could also be Czech. We have found Russian. We have found British. American D3 gloves look much like this, but are black. These systems will offer reasonable hand protection. The gauntlets are very obvious. They offer a cuff, which overlaps with the standard coats or gear that you're wearing. This is a very unique pattern in that the little finger is mated with the, with the, with the second finger next to it. The logic behind this particular system was that the small finger does not offer good circulation. And by being bonded to this, offers first of all reasonable traction and also mutual insulation in cold weather. First of all, the reason you've got these on is because it isn't exactly warm outside. Anybody who has experienced frostbite will know that once you've experienced frostbite, the parts that have been affected will be affected for life. Even if you are, if you do not succumb and pass on because of the experience, in other words, if the fingers freeze, chances are the rest of the body may follow, be warned. And uh, because of that, what happens is that the individual affected by frostbite usually will feel it during any cold weather experiences. And it's an aching pain that just never goes away. Again, wool. I cannot stress the benefits of wool enough. Yes, I know we've got wonder technologies out there all over the place. But four, four million sheep in, in Michigan and across the Midwest can't be wrong. For that reason, what we recommend is carrying plenty of spares. You can carry them in your, in your pants pockets. You can carry them in your coat pockets. You can carry spares in your backpacks. In fact, I'd recommend four or five pairs of wool liners, no matter what you're carrying, because, again, once your hands get wet, you've got to bring, maintain the body temperature that's there and then also bring the temperature back up if possible. Well, by, by using wool, whatever is wet, when moisture makes contact with wool, this is one of the few materials that forces the moisture from the inside out. And so any area that's making contact with the skin will start to dry very quickly. During the process of using these, once you wet a pair of standard wool liners, we recommend then that there are two techniques to be used. One is to take them and put them in the crotch area, which is a very warm area. Your natural body heat will help to force the moisture out of these, these gloves and progressively they can be reused. Another option, of course, is to put them under the armpits. Now, of course, meanwhile, switching over to a dry set of gloves with, that you utilize on a regular basis until such time as you can secure yourself into what is a safe area or you can uh, do a little laundry, as we say. The gauntlets also offer palm and thumb protection, as you can see. And while there are many variations on this, from American to British to uh, Central European, etc., the basic theme does not change. And again, 
because we're militia, if you can find a better solution or something that works more to your needs, then you can adopt it. We do not have the bureaucracy to contend with, and that in itself gives us a tremendous advantage when it comes to trying to acquire special or new technology. Next considerations, of course, and last with regard to the cold weather gear, but not the least, is, of course, the combat boot or winter boot. Now, these are two examples, and yes, both of them are slightly used. One is, of course, a pair of standard infantry U.S. Mickey Mouse boots. The other is a set of East German, and yes, used, guards boots with a felt pack system. Now, both have been heavily experimented with and tested by militia units. The, of course, Mickey Mouse boot has been proven for many, many years, going back to the Korean War, and has saved many a soldier's toes from being lopped off. While the other, of course, is a simple solution and fairly economical, for medium to uh, uh, low cold weather, it requires ad additional support, such as multiple layers of uh, standard wool socks, etc., etc., to be creative. These are a decent combat boot, of course, for utility use, and again, are easy on, easy off. The Mickey Mouse boot, especially for vehicle operators, aircraft uh, um, personnel, ground line personnel, armored crewmen, anybody who has to sit in any particular situation or is out in, in sub-zero weather and has to continue to operate will find these to be the best choice across the board. No, they're not pretty, and they aren't going to win any, uh, shall we say, handsome awards, but they are a very effective system and are time proven. Note the cleat pattern on the base of the boot. And again, these are almost a brand new pair. Uh, this particular system is very simple using an insulator layer. Yeah, it does look like a, a tire because it's basically made like a tire. Uh, while this system is, uh, again, sometimes pricey, if you're fortunate enough to be undersized 10 or oversized 12, these boots are fairly reasonably priced. 10s and 11s have been running a premium for quite some time. But the system itself is second to none. And while there are many people who claim to have come up with better ideas, I have seen people fully immerse their feet with these boots on, and in less than five minutes have their feet up to, bo up to normal body temperature. Because of the very nature of the way these things are sealed, much like an inner tube, uh, they maintain a good portion of the body heat, and feet, remember, like hands, will take the rest of the body down very quickly. So we highly recommend the use of Mickey Mouse boots, especially in the, in the northern climes, in any temperate areas where there's a possibility of seeing a cold spike. They are a specialty item with regard to purchase and should be maintained. One of the best techniques can be used is to use talcum powder when storing these boots to maintain and preserve the rubber. Take a plastic bag, insert the boots, sprinkle the talcum powder in, and flush and, and, and uh, jog the bag. This will allow the talcum powder to saturate and cover the cell and cover the uh, surface of all of the rubber, rubber areas and the inside of the boot. That way, by the time you need them next season, they're going to be fairly well preserved and ready for use. On the other hand, and of course, uh, you'll have to forgive us for the, for the fact that we see a few wear spots on this leather, any combat boots, especially that are used during the winter months, must be maintained. That includes, of course, polishing and then sealing the leather itself. Also, proper drying. Whenever, whenever possible, up to three pairs of combat boots should be an issue for every single person. With the boots taken off every day, one set allowed to dry, another set in use, and another set being prepared. At least two pairs are desirable because you can pull one pair out of service and allow it to dry and then perform maintenance on it while wearing the other pair. This will increase the lifespan of the boots and, of course, maintain uh, good integrity with regard to the leather. Maintaining the cell surface ensures water repellent cell surface ensures water repellents and also that you don't lose those calories that are being collected in the foot area. As most of you do know, your feet are a very hot area too, so uh, once you have retained this body heat, you can maintain the temperature with it by simply moving the feet for any period of time. Both systems will work, and again, there's a veritable army, forgive the pun, of boots that are available for any of you soldiers or militiamen that are out there. You get to choose, but remember, if your feet go, so goes the rest of the body when the time comes, and I will refer to the uh, Revolutionary War, bloody footprints in the snow. There was a reason. They didn't have enough boots, and they didn't have proper protection from the environment that they were working in. Let's not make that mistake this time around. If you need spares, or if you don't have spares, I should say, buy them, you will need them. There is not going to be a cobbler just around the corner or a Kmart down the road when the time comes. At this point in time, we'd like to demonstrate is utilizing a variety of different systems. We've got a conventional SAR operators, and not necessarily an automatic weapon, but in this case, utilizing a large capacity drum, 
As we said, every weapon, if it's semi-automatic, should have one. In this case, an AR-15 with a 125-round uh, large-capacity magazine. In addition to that, taking advantage of old material that is presently available, this is old ripstop, woodland camouflage, uh, circa 1975, 78, allowed to bleach out. It creates a lighter material than is normally ex uh, expected. Not a standard pattern. And cutting and roughing is fine. As with a ghillie suit, you're breaking up the normal patterns. It can be held and retained as needed and also discarded when necessary. One of the other things that would be done with this weapon under a cold weather environment or with varying conditions is to, as we saw with the, with the counter sniper, sniper rifle systems, would be to cover and block many of the overt areas of this rifle to break up its overall pattern. White electrical tape, white duct tape, cloth material, even burlap can be used to break up that particular pattern. While this is a solid white camouflage smock, standard US issue, the different colors with the web gear and other components that are attached do help to break up the overall silhouette. Again, eye protection, which is crucial, especially in a winter environment for sentries and any type of long range operations, help to reduce strain, wear and tear, of course, on the eyes themselves. This is a basic example of integrating a variety of different systems, and again, uh, at your discretion, these weapons can be brought to bear with effective firepower and with effective support carried by the individual rifleman. Utilizing a variety of different pieces of equipment here, most of it, of course, standard East German and DDR technology, uh, the winter, winter weather camouflage works exceptionally well with our small personnel. Uh, from extra small to small will fit anywhere from uh, young uh, middle-aged children to, of course, young teens, middle teens, women, female personnel, and a lot of other uh, individuals that normally cannot be outfitted. The equipment is very economically priced, as we've said before. In this case, utilizing a short-action uh, carbine, bolt action, and adapting the standard uh, first aid pouches uh, and other technology, what we have is a light infantryman's kit, very economical. You might notice also that the glove liners are a commercial pattern that are done in a model uh, uh, color uh, scheme of both yellow and green. This is an excellent camouflage uh, configuration. Uh, headgear in this case is a German helmet liner. Now the U.S. and German helmet liners are of course a cold weather item and are much sought after nowadays by uh, not only uh, militia enthusiasts, but many other people across the country. They're in vogue again. It's a very desirable system. It can be used in a variety of different ways. It covers both the ears, the back of the neck, has a visor in the front, and of course is lined. It will also cover the chin. Standard scarf configuration can be discarded as needed to ventilate, but remember again, for many people, they're going to be dealing with sentry operations. And so, uh, with this configuration, is again a very economical, very desirable package that will keep your person in the field for an extended period of time without a great deal of uh, muss or complication. Again, uh, depending on the weapon, the web gear would be adapted accordingly. In this case, the 6.5 millimeter bolt action is again a light duty reservist weapon, uh, still more than effective at doing exactly what it did 100 years ago or less, putting a hole in targets at approximately 3 to 400 yards. Uh, effectively and efficiently. Again, uh, this is an example of utilizing the same type of technology uh, with winter configuration that we saw during the summer phase and was demonstrated quite uh, extensively in equipping for the New World Order. The gentlemen this evening is give you a chance to see exactly what reloading is all about. Now, we've talked about the capability to produce ammunition for yourself. What we're going to show you here is practical application. Almost everything you're going to see, of course, is of professional grade, but is fully acceptable and is fully accessible to virtually all of you that are listening to us tonight. Now, as we've noticed, uh, as you peek through the doorway here, that one of the more sophisticated blue presses is available. This is a multi-station press with the pull of a handle, and we're going to be demonstrating this, of course, for you uh, during the program here. Uh, one individual step is followed through on by the press itself. You'll notice that everything is divided and is appropriately inventoried so that you have an understanding and a good control over production flow. Uh, case reamers, we're looking of course at the finished product which you're going to see here. Individual cases divided by specific type, size, and of course composition. Nickel, nickel cases, conventional brass, and nothing, and we'll repeat this through the whole process, nothing for the reloader is junk. Anything that is taken off the case is preserved and saved for future use, possibly. In this case, as with the Dillon presses, of course, the important thing is maintain cleanliness, as you can see. Parts inventories are maintained. Brass, as it's being processed, is maintained in individual containment vessels. These are used for everything from tools.
uh, to precision devices. You'll notice also, of course, as we proceed through, that any time you can preserve information, it's made available. And for this reason, of course, take advantage of the many different manufacturers. We're not promoting any particular type of bullet nor any particular type of press. In this case, this is the uh, operator's choice and again is a very desirable system. Once you've established what it is that you feel comfortable with, then you follow through and become a professional in your particular area of expertise and interest. In this case, of course, you're going to see several different presses as we move into the room. And you'll find, of course, that there are different systems available. In this case, we have everything from the very static multi-head presses to individual portable presses. That's right. If you're going to be working out, why work out in the field with a bench machine? Why not make all that effort worth something? In this case, this is a single stage press. This is a single stage press. The dies are normally individually stationed in the press itself, calibrated to the particular case for depth and specification, and then simply insert a single piece of brass, and the rest is history. Now again, this is a fully portable unit that could be it theoretically backpack portable along with all the components for reloading. This particular one is made by Lyman. There are also com uh, systems of this type made by Lee and just about every other manufacturer presently in the United States. It should be considered that there are many different solutions but there are also some new problems that arise when you're dealing with reloading, not least of which of course is, as we said, precision. Scales are vitally important for specking uh, particular powder measurements and also doing quality control checks throughout the entire process. With uh, more precision shooting in a rifle and also uh, competition handgun, you even weigh the individual cases and test one against the other to try and come up with total consistency across the board. Not only do we have case reaming, but individual internal throat sizing. In this case, what we're looking at is a, uh, an older but still a very effective shotgun press. Uh, that's right, even your shotgun hells can be recycled. And there are a variety of different solutions with regard to, again, the types of manufacturers that are available that produce these presses. Uh, in addition to that, you'll notice in the background, inventorying and maintaining control over good quantities of cast bullets and conventional bullets that may be available for specific loads. Here, as we mentioned just a moment ago, is an example of a single stage press that can be put into use, a little older system again, and nothing nothing in the reloading field is obsolete. All of these presses can serve a purpose. And during uh, peak production periods, all of these presses would be in service. Another fine example for those of you who are drooling and salivating right now, if you have been in reloading for a period of time, is the fact that not only do we have the individual presses uh, established and the individual dies available, but specific heads have been generated for particular loads, in this case 357 Magnum, 40 caliber, 38 9mm, and of course we're looking at a stationing block to maintain control over, so, over the die sets so that no damage is incurred with any of the faces. All of these dies are set to depth and are prepared for use. Also, specific magazine powder charge uh, trickler, or tricklers are available. In this case, uh, depending upon your personal choice and the type of system that you commit to, these are ready to pull off the rack, put on the system, run a test set, make sure that your powder spec is correct by, again, measuring, and then when you're finished, of course, proceeding with production. might remind everybody, and again, you're going to have to do reading on this yourself, constantly check for the sake of safety and also for conservation. Remember, we don't want to be wasting powder. We want to find out, make sure that whatever we are using, we use to the best of our ability. As we mentioned before, specific types of bullets for particular missions, and as you can see, there are a variety of manufacturers. We don't have to mention them by name. I think many of them are recognizable simply by their containers. But again, you'll have to do research to find out what will best suit your needs. Uh, there's, of course, also other single station points. Uh, we have uh, bulk ball and buckshot in specific volume containers, or of course it can be produced by yourself. Uh, holders for individual cartridges during processing, and this is something that's often a variety of different themes and a variety of different uh, by a variety of different manufacturers, can hold everything from rifle to conventional pistol cartridges. And again, for mass production, it is important that we have these inventory devices on hand. Efficiency is the key. Sure, we don't lose that there. Now here, and I'm very impressed with this. This is not a factory produced item. This was done by the master loader that we have here this evening. And again, uh, it's a matter of what it is you're capable of improvising, what resources you can put together. 
These types of blocks, of course, can be produced in larger numbers so that many, many different heads can be put together with the die sets in place ready to be used. Once a system is developed, and once the uh, particular measurements and the specifications have been laid down and been locked in place, this will save you an incredible amount of time. And again, the ingenuity on the part of the individual is the key. The quality of the work that was done here, all handwork, by the way, is comparable to anything that was produced by the original manufacturer. In fact, in some cases, might actually be superior, both in the materials and the quality of workmanship. So again, as we've demonstrated time and again for you, the solutions are out there, it's in the minds of the American people, and you need to get involved for that reason. There are many of you sitting right now that are going, I can do that. That's right, you can, and a whole lot more. So once you have the basic ideas down, just a matter of you coming up with new solutions. Now another example here, something that is vital, of course, is reprocessing. Amazingly enough, ladies and gentlemen, the reloader is the ultimate recycler. Remember, they've been telling us for years that we've had to recycle. Don't worry, the uh, reloading uh, uh, people that are out there have been doing it for much longer than the government has. And in fact, uh, this particular case is an expended 30 out 6 round. And by, of course, using a standard walnut or corn husk or a variety of different types of mediums, as you can see here, and the variety of different tumblers that are available, we can reprocess this brass. And of course, I'll demonstrate the simplicity of the operation. short period of time, what you're going to have is a reprocessed brass prepared for reloading. Of course, there's still sizing to be done, checking to make sure that military crimps have been uh, reamed, uh, the pockets, the primer pockets have been re-reamed uh, so they can properly accept uh, commercial loads and can be reloaded more easily down the road. Also, overall case length is spec, as is going to be described here later. And this, the primary purpose here is to maintain a higher quality level across the board. We can come up with specifications and also with loads that are not only equal to, but in many cases superior to anything presently produced commercially. And consider this, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are not familiar with the situation, facilities like this, many times larger in some cases, are available all over the nation. This is the kind of solution that the Patriot Movement and the militia needs to make sure that production is up and online. As we were, were mentioning earlier, ladies and gentlemen, remember that the reloader is the ultimate in recycler. As you can see, uh, there are several different types of brass presently here, including volumes or quantities of brass, in this case, virgin, 762 by 39, 357 uh, virgin brass, this is never fired, and of course, volumes of once fired 357 brass, this still requires reprocessing. Now, as we saw with the tumbler earlier, this brass will be reprocessed, cleaned up, deprimed, checked for specification primed, check for specification, inspected for breakage, and then of course will be reprocessed and reloaded. You'll also notice that there are many other different calibers sitting here uh, in inventory. Nothing that you find in the way of brass is disposed of or thrown away. And remember, uh, in the future, especially with barter, you may have that last case or that last 20 rounds of something that somebody else needs to keep a certain rifle or certain handgun functional. For that reason, well, trade's important. And to have the brass available in our inventory makes it a heck of a lot easier for you to find it when you need it. Now, of course, uh, we're demonstrating also the idea that you keep inventory of your particular die sets. While you may not necessarily be shooting these particular sets, the objective is to have them on hand so that if you need to reload for somebody, you can. You'll notice also a quality difference in that these are three die carbide sets as opposed to conventional carbon steel. While these are good, these obviously are much better, a little more expensive, but in the long run they're worth the money because of proficiency in reloading and durability. If you're doing a lot of reloading, carbide dies would be your better choice. Now there's of course a lot of other solutions, but as you're seeing here, storage is important. You can save, maintain and save original factory containers, or you can purchase again volume containers for different types of devices or different types of devices for the different steps in the reloading process. Now, very quickly here, you'll notice a number of books that are on the shelf. And again, nothing in the reloading field is obsolete. There is a reason for maintaining the older information. In some cases, specific cartridges may have been deleted from inventories or may no longer be produced, and there may be a need for that particular loading data. A good example is the Spear Reloading Manual number 8. Well, that obviously implies that there were seven others before this particular text, and each one may have information on new powders or old powders that you may acquire in different quantities uh, through your rummaging around in yard sales, 
or by acquiring other loaders' inventories and resources. This will also, of course, provide you with mutual data that in the future you may be able to cross-reference to come up with new specifications for more sophisticated cartridges or specific loads for certain needs. Again, you have to use your creative mind. And the idea is to have a flow process set up here whereby, for your, for your own reasons, you have good control over your inventory, you maintain quality control, and of course the keyword safety is also incorporated here. Uh, flame doesn't uh, quite, uh, shall we say, connect well with gunpowder. So for those of you who are smokers, a good reminder should be uh, to keep the butts outside the loading room. Uh, more than one of you can attest to the experience of watching somebody bend over a loading pot full of powder once too often with that little extended ash for the last time. For that reason, again, uh, good quality control and also safety measures with regard to fire. be a good idea that with a loading site like this, you also have a fire extinguisher on hand. Uh, for obvious reasons, uh, these may be uh, these sites may be attached to the house or it could be in a, a separate site. But the idea is also to maintain control and safety so that we don't lose inventory. Remember that everything you've seen here is a machine. This is precision technology. Even the cheapest and most portable of equipment here is far superior to most everything that was available to our founding fathers over 200 plus years ago. This is, for all practical purposes, a light factory. Also maintain good environmental control, obviously. You're dealing with metals and also the possibility of oxidation. And quality control, again, is determined by keeping everything where it should be, a place where place for everything and everything in its place, as we see. And we're going to let our uh, master loader uh, take over for a bit and demonstrate this particular multi-station press, give you an idea of exactly what's involved. It's not that complicated. And again, we recommend that all of you no matter who is involved uh, with reloading, immerse yourself in the technology. There's a tremendous amount of written information available, and one of the things is that no matter what rifle or handgun you have, that you have reloading capability for virtually every standard cartridge that you're going to be using. Don't rely on factories. They can be shut down with the flick of a switch or the drop of a bomb, as we've seen throughout history. Well, without further ado, I'm going to let our uh, gentlemen here uh, deal with the reloading process and show you just how easy it is and how you two can become one of the Patriot factories across the nation. Okay, as he has said, this is the Dillon Precision Press. The first step in the, any press is the brass. When you have your brass cleaned up, get it ready. Normally, this is virgin brass. Normally, would have a primer in this spot. You would put it in the first slot in this press and most any of them. You'd go up into the die and down. Okay, that would size the die inside the die is a neck sizer and on the outside sizes the outside of the case. What it does it pushes the old primer out, it sizes the inside of the neck, pushes that outward, and then squeezes the inside, the outside of the case back in. With this case you have to go past center a little bit of force, and that seats the new primer. Okay, the reason I like the Dillon press is that it's a multifunctional press. When I get done showing you the different steps, after that, every single time I pull the handle, I'm going to have a completed bullet coming out. Instead of having to do one single step, all of them, the second step, all of them, I'll show you that on another press. So I just turn it this time, I put a new bullet casing in. This one switches this spot, I pull the handle. Back down, over center, seats my first one. Now I've put, in, I've put the powder in. Now this press is set up with an automatic powder feed. It very precisely measures the amount of powder that is going to be put in that bullet. It's done using a mechanism like this. This is the mechanism inside here. You can see that the powder can be adjusted in and out. As this arm moves in and out, the powder is adjusted. You use your scales that you saw before to make sure that you have your proper amount of powder. Okay, you turn it again, add another casing. This time you put the bullet on the top. You hold the bullet till it starts to go in the die, all the way to the bottom, all the way back down, over center, Okay, your bullet has been placed in the cartridge. It, some 
cartridges. They also, at the same time, they have crimp. They also, at the same time, they have crimp around the top, small amount. If you're loading pistols, they have another third die, which does the crimping for you. Let's turn it around. New casing, bullet. Completed bullet. One balls in. Completed bullet. Completed bullet. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple little things here on the bench. If you're using the other type of press, when you want to clean, you've knocked your primer out, you have a reamer here that reams the pocket. You, you ream it out, you clean it, you might need a tool like this to scrape any debris. You also have a tool like this, which is a pointed thing. We make sure it goes down through. Make sure that that hole is cleared completely out. After you've done all that, you can go over here. This is a, just put the casing in like that. And this particular one is not set up. This is set up for an all six. You'd come in. This goes in like that, and it makes the length of the case precise. Okay. After you've loaded a couple, you can take your calipers. This is a special caliper setup that holds on that particular size of the bullet, right, every time. And so you hold the bullet in the same position every single time. That shows you exactly the overall length of that case to that particular dimension. Type of press, when you run out of primers, sounds an alarm. So you reach over here, you take one of these tubes, you put it on the top of the press, you pull the pin out, your primers feed down into your tube here, you put it back on top, sit that back in here. So your empty tube, you have to reload it. So you walk over to this unit here, you pour some primers into this. It's made of brass, so it will not bark. You push down on it, and the primer goes up inside of here. Make an empty one. And the beauty of this little piece of equipment is the simplicity. When you pour your primers and you're going to have some upside down, some right side up. So you'll do the right side up ones, then you take a little piece of brass and just flip it over like that, and you're ready to do your other ones. And you're all ready for next time. You have other pieces of equipment for measuring depth. You have a great deal of different kinds of equipment that goes along with it that makes the job easier and more precise. Okay, this is the more common type of press that you're going to come across. It's a single stage press where it does only one bullet at a time rather than three or four as the Dillon did. In this press we haven't got dies in it yet right now but it'll show you. You put the casing in, it goes up, it takes, punches the primer out just like the Dillon did in the first step. You come down, you take the case out, you put it in your holder over here. You would do the same thing to all your cases. One thing I didn't tell you on the Dillon is you have to put a grease over top of the casing or else it will stick in the die. Okay, now that you're, you've already taken your primers out, if this was military brass, you'd have to use a tool like this or else use a reaming tool. This lays it down, you make this motion here, it expands the cartridge base so that you can put the new pr type primers in it. Okay, on this one here, when you got all your primers out, you come to your next step, you'd come in, you'd raise it up, swing your arm around like that, push the little button and it puts a primer in, or if you don't have a press like this, you just put a primer on top. You slide that back down, you put your bullet in it, Again, it seats your primer. And then, if you have a press like this, you can take the old, this is another old style of powder horn, the old standby. You can, this one here mounts on the press, a lot of them, they just mount it on another, on the bench somewhere. That gives you a precise measurement of powder. And then, on this press, you would just turn it like that, and you'd have your finishing die here. You go up through. Just before it enters the press, you'd put your bullet on it, pump, you do it. So it takes you three to four steps on every single bullet instead of just one pull of the handle.
Next to it here is the old shotgun press. The old shotgun press, you take one bullet, slide her in, you go down, takes the primer off the first step. Second step, puts a new primer in. Third step, you go down, you go that way, puts the powder in. You come back up, you put a wad in it, push her back down, go that way, that puts the shot in and should be left sealed for as long as possible until such time as they need to be used or mounted on the gas mask itself. And remember that this external filter need not be pulled even though the internal mount filter with the threads is mounted in place. Now the Israeli Civil Defense Mask is an excellent mask for both uh, teens and of course adults. But because of our requirement for individuals who, of course, are younger in years all the way down to children, a series of other masks are available and have been made available for a number of years, including the Russian Civil Defense series of masks. In this case, a full skull-type mask. This covers or addresses one of the issues we have discussed in the past concerning covering the ears. And you'll notice that when the original casting was made, accommodation is made for an ear cup to allow it properly seal and protect the ear channel. In addition, the standard thread sizes on both these filters and those for the Nate for NATO are the same. While these filters may have a variance in protection and, of course, are dated, this can be demonstrated here, these filters can be supplemented with additional NATO protection, and this mask can be upgraded quite dramatically. For those of you who are curious to find out what size, and again, yes, the Russian masks are sized, what size will fit the party that you're dealing with, you need only look to the chin point on the mask itself on either side and you will find a circular point with a numerical value inside the mask. This particular mask is a size 3 which is just below a large between a medium and a large and will fit many of the common adults available. A large or 4 or 5 size mask will fit people who have more hair, uh, uh, body hair, some facial hair of course may, may bulk out the mask itself and people just have larger heads, some have larger heads than others. For children's masks, you want to go down to a zero or a one. And these masks will fit individuals all the way down to approximately one and a half to two years of age. Remember that because of child development, the head is already close to, although not to, to total specification for an adult. For that reason, uh, these masks can be dropped down into the child range. There are also children's masks available from the Russian Civil Defense Mechanism. While these are not as sophisticated as many of the combat masks that we're seeing, again, the first question is, how long can you hold your breath? One of the advantages to most civil defense masks, which you may have noticed, is the fact that they're using a solid, flat plate glass. Now, these are all tempered glass, and when they've been broken, we have found that, again, they are a safety glass, so they do not uh, become as much of a threat to the wearer. However, if damage does occur, two things can be done to repair any of these masks. And duct tape, the miracle material that any patriot should be carrying with them, can be used to simply cover the area that's compromised. The other option, of course, for long-term field use is to have available plexiglass or plastic that can be cut to specification. Now, if you have a glass company, that's fine by me. If you can do circular cuts, well, there's another solution, of course, that's an option. Very simple to maintain. This equipment and technology can be easily supported in the field. Now, in addition to this, many of you probably have already accessed the standard M19, uh, the M17 uh, series gas mask. In this case, there's a few additional adornments. This is standard uh, so, uh, uh, surplus. In this case, an M17A2 with the drinking straw again. This system, of course, has the voice meter to the front intake unit covered with an additional nasal or I'm sorry, exhale port covered with an additional nasal, and you have supplemental filters on the outside. While the M17 is an excellent civil defense or combat mask, one of the shortcomings is the amount of time it takes to reload the cartridges. These cartridges are reinserted from inside the mask and do require for the operator to either fall back and switch the filters in a safe area or, and this of course is more likely, the operator will simply undone this mask and redon a fresh mask, sending this to the rear or having it destroyed because of contamination difficulties. In either case, the important thing is that you standardize on all of the parts necessary, and while we do not, forgive us, have a sample of the standard uh, M17 gas mask cover. These can be adapted to virtually all of the masks that you see here this evening. 
The M17 is a superior system with regard to overall protection, and again, if you already have them in service, supplement your inventory with less expensive masks that compare in quality, and the M15 is an example of that, or, of course, the batteries of civil defense masks that are available. In addition to conventional lenses, as you see with both the M17, the M15, and, of course, the Russian civil defense, Supplemental lenses are also available which fit over and cover this particular lens to protect it from external damage. These replacement lenses are designed to take whatever blow or strike takes place. They will of course protect the inner lens and will make sure that there is no compromising of the environment inside the mask. These systems again are very simple to maintain and the important thing is to of course make sure that your parties who are operating with these masks also understand how to adjust and again, there are instructions and information available. How the systems can be refitted accordingly if there is damage. What parts or assemblies may have to be replaced. And of course, again, practice in how to mount and dismount the filters is very important. Take advantage of the existing systems, the support technology. As we demonstrated earlier, and I will mount this again, on the Israeli civil defense mask and on all standard masks, that are made by Israel and by Germany, this particular system is made available. It gives also everybody an opportunity to see just exactly how the threads fit. And as we said earlier, this simulates the draw of a standard filter mounted on any of the masks that we've shown you so far. So rather than compromising what are becoming difficult to find spare filters or the original filters that you have, remember to maintain control over these and for practice and training, this is the tool to use. Now beyond the standard masks that we have at our disposal, we also have a variety of different chemical warfare protection systems through a variety of different inventories. In this case, U.S. manufactured chemical warfare suits are both in OD green and woodland camouflage patterns in a variety of sizes. You'll note that the available information, technology, and resources as far as the company involved are indicated on the outside of the package along with a specific size. Also, these packages and the vessels themselves are very user-friendly and provide us with all of the information for sizing the individual all the way up to and including extra, 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 extra large and the specific extra large and the specific instructions on how to formulate the specific suit for the party involved under weather conditions and other environmental conditions. These symbols, these symbols and uh, systems are very user-friendly as stated and again, American quality, uh, some of the best technology on the planet presently available for the militia. But remember, for all of the parties involved here, that this is surplus. These are finite resources, not infinite. And because of that, we are finding that the interest has is decreased availability. More of these suits are getting into our hands where they belong and are being dispersed. So as you find them, you must remember that you may not have available resources at hand indefinitely. What you need, you should pick up, and obviously still look for the best price. In addition to the chemical warfare suits made by the United States, chem defense suits are available from NATO. In this case, what we're dealing with are the standard NATO Mark III suits. There are a variety of different models that are available. This is the top. In addition, we have the bottom and two separate components. These are, un these are actually compressed and vacuum packed. Uh, trust me, once opened, they're much larger than they appear and will not, will not go back into the bags they were taken out of. However, these systems are just as desirable as the American. Uh, the dates will vary as far as production, but they are user fresh. And uh, I might remind you with all of the chemical warfare equipment that's available as far as the suits go, is if they have been compromised, at the very least, they make excellent cold weather equipment. Uh, you'll find that these do keep the heat in quite well. A demonstration of this was physically uh, made example of during a desert storm when uh, through heat exhaustion troops were dropping like flies in the 110 degree weather of Saudi Arabia. So again, remember that uh, once uh, dawn, the environment that you're in will dictate durability. That is why on the U.S. gas masks and also on the Israeli masks, a consideration was made for taking in water because of the possibility of dehydration and progressive uh, water deprivation. In all cases, the equipment must be kept dry and maintained under a, under a clean environment, if at all possible, for as long as possible. And again, uh, these should be stored with your basic uh, equipment, your house load and your web gear, as they are a combat battlefield uh, device. 
All of this is mutual supporting technology. You can mix it and match it as needed, depending upon what is available at, the, at any given time. Remember that as with all of the other tools that you're using for the militia effort, you must maintain your equipment. It must be kept clean. You must also do regular inventories to make sure that nothing has been compromised and that everything is still fully functional. Covered so far. That's uh, used by the militia and also by independent formations across the nation is off-the-shelf technology or hand-me-downs, of course, from foreign military services. Well, some of the other things, of course, that are coming online, uh, part of them, of course, spread by the New World Order, are uh, readily applicable to uh, many of our missions uh, with regard to the militia, both for medical support, cruiser weapons support, uh, aviation technology. A veritable battery of uh, pieces of equipment have been put online that we can in integrate into the militia effort and in the future will be vital to maintaining operations. Uh, first of all, as has been uh, probably mentioned, many of you have been in service in the past, and one you've been educated is if you don't know where you are, ain't no sense in worrying about where you're going. Well, navigation is a crucial issue, as we can demonstrate here, with much of the equipment that's available. And as you can see, we've gone from the very simple and traditional all the way through to uh, state-of-the-art. Well, that's right, we have the conventional compass. In this case, I am uh, looking at what is a standard lensatic, liquid-filled, uh, with conventional templates for basic orienteering work. Uh, again, something you'll see on here, which I do want to stress, and while it's in red, it could be color, could be changed, but either way, a lanyard is crucial. Number one, these are pieces of equipment that you're seeing here that you do not want to lose. As with most of your other manufactured goods, a lanyard especially when you consider the fact that most of the time when you're using this equipment, somebody's trying to kill you probably, will prevent you from losing technology that, uh, well, at certain times may not be quite as important as your life with regard to getting out of the way. Uh, you'll notice also there are several other pieces here, not the least of which is very simple technology. Again, conventional navigational templates. There are many different types that are made, but you should remember that if you're using mapping technology of any kind, these templates are priceless with regard to operations, not just simply plotting land navigation from point A to point B, but also for such operations as artillery range finding, artillery control, mortar crewman control, and or of course forward observers, and all of the technologies you're seeing here will assist most of your cruiser weapon problems. Not only conventional navigational technology, but as you're seeing here, and of course, again, this is new state-of-the-art equipment that is user-friendly, Satellite navigation technology is now available and affordable. The only thing I will say is, remember, <laughs> they usually don't come with enough batteries to carry spares. In this case, the technology is available for anywhere from as little as 200 to as high as several thousands of dollars, and it's a matter of the resources that are available at hand for you. How can this be used? Well, in many cases, of course, in the future, we're going to be needing to support, as we said, crew serve technology, and it would be nice to be able to zero areas in, in the future. You should always know how to use conventional manual equipment, such as compass and, of course, templates, and map reading should be a first priority for all of your services, be they medical, infantry, armor, or artillery. But again, we're finding that these systems, for their cost, are easily portable, easily usable, and, of course, are, again, vital to long-term uh, survivability on the battlefield. Integrated with the land navigation technology is also, of course, range finders, as we've discussed with other optics in the past. Simple, user-friendly equipment is available in from a variety of different manufacturers. In this case, of course, direct line of sight uh, reference for riflemen, uh, heavy weapons and ordnance, artillery pieces, anti-tank weapon systems, etc. It's desirable that your forward observers be provided with whatever is available that can be pulled off the shelf that is, again, user-friendly and affordable. Now, I wanted to tie this in again because while all of this is definitely uh, usable <laughs> without communications, whoops, then the rest uh, takes more time to transfer downrange, either by flags, carrier pigeon, or whatever it is that you have. So integrating effective communications is important. Again, yet another solution in this case is a Cobra, uh, Cobra handheld radios. There are a variety of different systems to choose from. In, in this case, both with a uh, voice mic and earpiece to keep the noise that is observable down and, of course, to maintain operational security with communications on a regular basis. You want to make sure that, if possible, you keep everything as far as sound discipline, noise discipline, to a minimum. Now, again, uh, from top to bottom, and remember this, 
First of all, conventional land navigation technology should be carried by all parties. This isn't the Russian army. Soviet military standard and doctrine dictates only a handful of people had the capability to read maps and use maps. The problem with that is, of course, if you lose the guys that know how to do it, well, everybody else falls apart when the time comes, and that's why it's so easy to beat most of these foreign forces. In our case, we need to see as much redundant training as possible. All of this technology should be integrated into as many different parties as possible so that when one falls, another person can pick the equipment up. Now, shifting a little bit, once we've got the troops in the field, one of the other things we're looking at, and of course we didn't get a chance to touch on this, are of course food and meal preparation. Almost all of you are familiar with the standard MREs now, but and again, availability varies from different one part of the country to the next in different forms and sources. And even if pieces are available, these are still a desirable pack-ready meal source. Uh, MREs are an option. Of course, old sea rats may still be available in different forms, and depending on where you are in the world listening to this tape, you may also remember that sea rations are still issued to many countries. So you may find either type of conventional combat meal available. In addition to this, though, one of the other solutions, and of course this has to do with many of the different subjects that we are dealing with, not just food, but general utility storage for long-term combat support. Canning operations can be made available to uh, just about anybody in the patriot movement across the nation. As you saw in an earlier part of uh, this particular tape, we also discussed, of course, reloading techniques, and you'll be seeing different pieces on this progressively. Much like the reloading presses that you uh, were uh, witnessing, uh, you're also going to find that the reloading uh, capabilities for these cans are quite similar. It looks like a large single-stage reloading press. The can is mounted in place, and as you're probably seeing an image of this right now, a lid, once the material has been popped inside, is positioned over the open uh, orifice. It is depressed. The rim is cased and recrimped. And what you have is a containment vessel separate from the outside environment. Advantages of this technology is, for instance, the can that I'm holding here is a standard number 10 can that contains, and I'll read it off for you, three tape, uh, three medical tape, 15 conventional uh, uh, three by four dressings, and three each four by seven dressings. Uh, it's been repainted in a standard primer paint, uh, whatever is available off the shelf, in this case uh, from uh, one of our distress resale facilities called Big Lot. For 88 cents a can, the paint just simply covers to prevent rust. Another point that should be made, standard nomenclature and symbols should be brought about so that you can identify the individual uh, uh, material that's inside. And in addition to that, of course, we have identified what's in the container in more than one location. And in my case, yes, we're a little paranoid about this idea. So we have it written in one location, oh, then another location, then another location, and yet a fourth. This way there is no failure to identify what it is that has been contained inside this particular holding device, and it does not have to be compromised purely to identify the contents. Now, one point should be made. During the Bay of Pigs crisis, when the uh, Cuban uh, dissidents uh, invaded Cuba and were betrayed by the U.S. government, we might make that point, one of the mistakes that was made, uh, very intentional and obviously was sabotage, is that many of the containment cans that were issued to the uh, Cuban rebels uh, were mismarked. 30 caliber ammo cans that were ham tins of this type contained 50 caliber ammo. 50 caliber cans contained mortar rounds, and so on and so on. And in fact, it became very difficult because of mismarking for them to identify what was inside. Well, by you canning and identifying the product and making sure that it's marked, it's very simple for you to maintain control over the inventories that you have. And by the way, one of the recommendations, and ignore all the other keys on my ring, you might notice a little tool here that is presently available to just about everybody on this planet, though some of you soldiers from Vietnam and, of course, Korea will remember it quite well. This is the P-38 can opener, and this particular device is priceless. Simple, easy to maintain, obviously. In fact, KISS, keep it simple, stu stupid, is a basic rule. The P-38 can opener simply mounts onto the rim, and, of course, by adding pressure, you can progressively open this can. And you'd be amazed when you're hungry as to just how effective this can opener can be. Well, one of the things that we do with all of these uh, devices when we store them is we take one or two P-38 can openers and we glue them to the top of the can or tape them in place. The advantage to this is that no matter which case you're thrown of six cans, you will always have the technology on board to open what is in the box 
And in addition, progressive, through progressively through issuing these particular containment vessels, the P-38s are individually distributed to different parties. If at all possible, every person in your unit, not only combatants but uh, auxiliary personnel and children, should be carrying one of these can openers in a key ring or on a lanyard, similar to what we're seeing right here, so that this tool is made available. Now, the little trick, by the way, is that the end of the P-38 can opener, made of fine American steel, also works quite well as a screwdriver or a prying tool. So again, whatever you're carrying has multiple purposes. This is a very simple tool, a very basic idea, but most people seem to forget this. Somehow, trying to use my fingernails to get into this number 10 can is not my first ambition in a combat zone. So again, keep it simple stupid, pay attention to what's going on, and make these available to everybody. They're very economical, anywhere from 25 cents to 50 cents a piece, depending on where you are. The government made millions. Well, probably in dollars, more than one. Now, as far as the cans themselves go, remember, you will find that these cans come in the raw. One of the other questions that's normally asked by people who see this system and also observe the, 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 how they're being loaded and the fact that they're so effective and so simple to use is, do I have to use just number 10 gallon can, one gallon cans? No. There are a variety of different heads for the system that are available, and you can package all the way down to conventional tuna cans or soup cans as far as serving size goes all the way up to and including ham tin cans. Tin cans. So this is a very effective system. The cost per unit can be identified by other parties. And by the way, not only are there electric versions of this system, there are also manual hand crank canners. Another tool which will come in handy for long-term storage purposes is also replacement cans. Well, you don't need to buy any as long as you maintain the ones that you have. There's a device called a re-rimmer, which cuts off the upper part of this can and then relips it so that this can can be reloaded ten different times. First by cutting it five times this way, and then by cutting five times this way. Taking a percentage of the can off each time, these cans can be, oh, we'll use that word again, recycled. So here's an advantage for you to, uh, one of the things that you can do is if you're in food services, most people I can see the lights are coming on even as I mention this, food service people who are involved with cafeterias, industrial facilities, etc., will be able to acquire these cans for little of nothing. In fact, usually free. They have a difficulty getting rid of them. So what we're, we're uh, recommending is if you can, you know, get into that recycling habit and acquire these things as quickly as possible. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, what we're going to cover is the basic house loader backpack. Now, there are many different variations on the theme as far as foreign uh, manufactured, U.S. manufactured, what period and era. In this case, we're very quickly going to brief you on the Alice Pack uh, series of uh, backpacks. This is a medium. They also come in large, and yes, they did make a small and still do. Difficult though they are to find, they are available. Now, the Alice Pack system was designed so they could be integrated many different ways with other types of web gear and equipment that were available in inventories across the world. In this case, the basic component is the primary sack itself, which is fully adjustable in many different ways, the adjustable shoulder harness, kidney pad, and, of course, alloy frame. Now, the frames, uh, there's a debate about whether or not they should be used. In most cases, of course, uh, it's a good idea for structurally supporting the amount of weight that's here. And depending on how your individual web gear has been established, your combat load will determine how you want to configure the backpack. While the medium Alice pack does provide for individual connectors, which are located at the top of the pack, and also stations to the bottom so that the straps can be set up with a non-supported backpack, the large Alice pack absolutely quote, requires an alloy frame, and it's recommended that with both, especially when carrying excessive loads such as spare batteries, auxiliary munitions, and large quantities of food because of their weight per volume that uh, the frame would be, be used in, the, in those particular conditions. This particular pack has the LC2 type kidney pad and of course also comes with the waist binders which are designed to keep the backpack from flopping when it's being used. In this case, this particular pack has a quick release system which is very desirable with almost all of the equipment you're using and whenever possible switch over to this system allows you to individually adjust by dimension, squeeze, and you're out of it. One of the other points that should be made is, of course, also a quick disconnect system for the shoulder straps. Why? Well, if you've ever been trying to run from somebody or if you've ever hit water, you're going to understand very quickly why it is that adjustment and disconnect is important. 
There are a variety of different ways that the equipment can be broken down and disassembled, as you can see. And again, know your equipment. Play with the technology. Don't just throw it together and put it away. Play with it. Find out how it works. Find out what works best for you. Remember that once you've adjusted these stations, for instance, these points, you can also reconnect with electrical tape. And by the way, electrical tape does come in colors, ladies and gentlemen, browns, greens, tans, whatever color is uh, indigenous for the particular season. And you can adjust these particular stations and then tape them in place so that, that they do not move. These particular points, of course, as you saw, were involved, involving quick disconnects or adjusters, which allow you to easily slip the equipment on and off. As the load gets heavier, this becomes more difficult. Remember also that when dealing with backpacks or other combat loads that require weight, the buddy system is still important. In fact, the most common mistake made is, don't worry, I can handle it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is part of a team effort. So when you see somebody struggling with equipment before you see a problem, before you see, have an injury, before somebody twists a back out of shape or has a problem with difficulty with a slip disc or whatever, get in there and help each other. That's one of the keys to the overall effort of, your, of the uh, militia and also any military operation. It makes no difference. Now, very quickly, at the base, we'll start from the bottom and work our way up, there are a series of connector points on the Alice Pack that mimic each other, in this case a wraparound connector that can be used for a hanger. And if you'll notice, these two stations, which normally have a separate set of straps, which are not readily available, but can be improvised even using belt material or conventional military belts, to secure a blanket roll, your sleeping bag assembly, whatever it is that you decide to attach, or whatever supplemental gear you may wish to use. As you move up through the equipment, you'll notice that you have variable adjuster straps. Do not cut these down. There are many different uses for the straps, and the reason for the excess is so that, again, if you wish to attach other material to the rear, the sleeping bag, blanket roll, or other equipment can be attached and stuck under this, and then, of course, secured accordingly. Now, almost all of the pack is designed to be adjustable for a very specific reason, noise. Remember that if you have something flopping around inside this, this particular pouch, the more noise you make, especially uh, during hours of stealth, you know, preferably at night, the more likely you're going to be heard before you are seen. So once cargo loads are reduced because of consumption or usage, there is an adjustment capability with each one of these chipmunk pouches on the outside, which then allows you to open the device by using the standard snap openers. In this case, very good idea. Disposables are put to the outside where they're going to be consumed and used first. Now again, do not make the mistake of cutting or snipping off any excess, but if you do have it and you'd like to get it out of the way, you can again tape these positions and these tapes or these excess rolls in place so they don't flop around or catch anything. As we move to the top of the Alice pack, in this case, we'll open up a little more for you. You will see a series of old M1910 type hangar stations which also have slip points for other web gear. The M1910 hangar is the type that you see on the old 1911 uh, 45 magazine uh, holsters. And also, and yes, there is an example here on this particular canteen station located on the side in which an M1910 hangar has been used. Now, these particular stations, just as the one that's wrapping around the mouth of the backpack, are designed to either take the standard modern M1956 connectors or the older 1910 hangers, which will allow you to integrate equipment from over 70 years of production. Very simple and easy to use. One of the things I do like about the canteen, uh, the canvas covers, is that, uh, again, they're quiet. Notice the difference in noise factor here. The fact that, again, uh, these, will absorb, uh, these will absorb water if you're familiar with how canteens cool. Uh, and most of you wonder why all that fuzzy stuff is inside. The felt is saturated with water. The canteen is installed, and through natural convection, the transfer of heat and the extraction of moisture, we actually cool water while it's being carried. Either newer or older canteen covers can be distributed, or canteens can be distributed on the backpack. And I'll turn this around this way. You can carry two, preferably balancing the canteens out, two or four canteens from these particular stations. In addition, and again, many of you prefer, would like to carry, for instance, machetes or other types of edged weapons. While the side station is convenient, there is a slip point to the back of these pouches which allow you to carry the machete from the 1910 hanger point here, sliding the scabbard into and behind this particular pouch. 
It allows for this equipment to be attached and prevents the thing from flopping around and making noise. It's important to remember that these, again, these little features are not always explained in every one of the manuals that you can find out there, and most of these do not come with instruction guides. However, simple, easy procedures to understand. Moving to the top of the backpack, and we'll finish this up very quickly, we have a Velcro closer with a convenience pouch. What should you put up here? Spare socks, spare glove liners, items that you need to get to that you may have to change. Remember, if your fingers go, the rest of the body follows, as we discussed with cold weather operations. From this location, a lot of equipment can be kept in Ziploc bags, pulled out, popped, and then used accordingly as needed. Again, to close, no big deal, very simple. You also have, of course, a seal or wraparound connector around the outside, which is nothing more than a conventional lanyard loop, ring, and grommet. Uh, by tightening these on, of course, you can blossom, or you can either open, in other words, or contract this particular point and seal up the base of the, of the backpack itself. Now, while we're not going to pull everything out of this particular house pack, you'll notice, oh, look, right on the top, yes, that's what we're finding here, spare socks, both types, both wool. In the back of the pack, you will find yet, a, a, yet another adjustable station. That's what this strap is attached to. It is to the back wall of the backpack itself. And otherwise, there's a large single chamber. This is designed for carrying auxiliary uh, mule, uh, meal packs or, uh, for instance, uh, through the buddy system, hard pack items that are going to be stowed close to the body, which means they're being kept lowest to the ground during, the, during a fighting situation in the prone position. Spare batteries for the PRC-25 and PRC-77. Munitions, spare magazines, ammunition, uh, criti critical tools. Remember, sometimes on patrolling operations, tools are designated to people specifically for the mission. And these items are, are located where they can be found commonly by other team members if this person is not capable of using his equipment. Again, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. You'll find a lot of good equipment. I can see right from the top here, including, of course, the ever-present survival blanket. For so many purposes, this thing is, is crucial, and of course, as a first aid item, is essential. Remember again, seal everything back up here very quickly. Diaphragm type top. In this case, with a tie type rope, but you'll also see what is an M1972-73 keeper, which is a slide type fastener. It has a locking device in the center, which allows, to be, allows for it to travel up and down the individual uh, cords and can be contracted accordingly to tighten up and lock in place. The ALICE system is very desirable for obvious reasons. Again, some people will complain that in some ways it just seems a little overcomplicated. I don't believe that is the case. There are, of course, cheaper solutions which don't offer as many options. But the ALICE system is now readily available in surplus resource points around the land. Uh, has been around since about 1972-73 in its earliest form has been fully developed and is ready off the shelf to use. If you have another solution, again, one of the advantages of the militia situation is we can adapt accordingly. But this is a house load as we've described in the past. It can be added to or, or subtracted from at the need of the mission and the operator and his physical limitations. Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the time that you've spent with us. And we understand that your time is precious to you just as it is for us. We ask that at this point in history, you make the supreme effort to prepare. One of the purposes behind the equipping one and two tapes was to give you the opportunity to think through what it is that you will need to be ready when the time comes. Now remember, we're not looking for a place to hide. Our objective is to know how to survive, to prepare for the future. We plan on winning, and to do that, we need you to pass through these times and get on to the, move on to the future. Now, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and we hope that with all of the things that we've put on these tapes, that we've given you some ideas. But remember, the first effort has to be in your ballpark. You're going to have to become students. You're going to have to immerse yourself in the subject and develop the knowledge yourself. With the millions of people that we have in the Patriot movement, we have the capability to come up with a solution.
she's been made to suffer for the profit of a few. Storm clouds are out forming. Winds of change now touch our shores. I hear forefathers are crying As the dreams been cruising around